Good morning. Well, good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. We seem to have our challenges today, don't we? You, you know, um, I worry sometimes when I select a passage that uh, it, it may be one that is very hard to explain to you or bring current to you or make relevant to you. And it seems that the Apostle Paul, that is, the Apostle Paul, um, made statements to people that he had to do the same. He had to make it relevant. He had to make it to where people of his time understood. And um, it is important for us to remember that, that Paul didn't have the whole Bible, did he? He had the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books. But he didn't have written before him the things that we have as resources for us to learn. And so when he explained things, he would go back to the things that were important to the people. And most of the people he talked to and about understood God and God's relationship to humankind. And they knew about the father of fathers, Abraham. And so as Paul shares with the Roman, the people of the intent of his letter, that he refers back to the very beginning. And so this morning, the title is Love Not Obligation. It comes to us from the fourth chapter of Romans. And we're going to do the first five verses, then we're going to skip to verses 13 through 17. So as we pursue an understanding of where Paul was coming from then, we make it relevant, hopefully make it relevant, prayerfully make it relevant to us today. So Paul triumphantly proclaims that God's divine promise is never earned by towing some legal line. We call that an obligation. It is, an, it is a result of outpouring of God's grace, which we would also refer to as unconditional, unconditional love. And so it is that Paul now makes this remarkable claim that since faith, we might call faith loving trust, not the law, which we refer to as obligation, is the criteria for God's promise to us. The promise extends beyond Abraham and his biological offspring to any and all of us that share the faith of Abraham, who has been given the title Father of us all. To sum all of that mumbo jumbo up, maybe it is that we just must live love, not live love out of obligation. And maybe that's the best way to understand. It's love for the sake of love, not love as an obligation. See if we can interpret the things that Paul says to us in the book of Romans. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring re received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith. 
so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. Not only to those who are of the law, but also those who have faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. It is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So I would say to you that there are two implications of the truth that we are justified. Justified, you know, being brought into a right relationship with God. Or maybe a better way of making justification clear. It is divine forgiveness because of Christ's ultimate sacrifice that the unworthy are reconciled, free of guilt, saved by grace. It is a faith thing for those who are undeserving. The Apostle Paul goes back to what they recognized, what they related to, all the way back to Genesis, to prove his point. Abraham had nothing to do with God's pronouncement that he was a righteous man, except that he had faith except that he believed. You, you see, faith is something totally different from works. Faith has nothing to do with the law which guides us. The Jews revered Abraham as the direct ancestor of theirs and a role model for their faithfulness. He was a key person in God's plan of salvation in the Old Testament. Abraham's faith was credited with his be bequeath as a righteous man. But what exactly does that mean, credited? Basically, it is that none of us deserve to be known as righteous. It was by his faith that he was granted by God the status of, of righteousness. So let me say it this way. Suppose a man works and his employer comes to him with pay. That's not a gift. That is a, a, a deserved wage that he worked for. Now God is not now nor ever has been obligated to offer grace to anyone. He says, because you see, God gives grace freely to sinners. Well, we qualify in that part. It's not credited to them because, you see, it's not an earned position. So Paul would call those of faith Christians. It kind of refers to us who receive that title as a perk for doing nothing. A perk for not working. It, now you have to understand, in Paul's day, it was a little bit of a different understanding. It, it wasn't saying that we're lazy. It's just that we were undeserving of that grace. Because you see, in Paul's day, the description of a Christian to mean a believer in God as one who trusts God. Trust God. Do, do you trust God? We're not innocent, just forgiven by our faith. Once we understand this concept, this premise, worship from us to God follows a matter of course. That's why it's mandatory to understand that when we do come into God's house, when we do pray, when we do call ourselves Christian, the focus has to be from us to God, not from us to us. It's not about who we are, it's who God is to us. It's a gift. May we use it well. I found a quote from a person named Eugene O'Neill. And Eugene says that, that man is born broken. That he lives by mending and God is the glue. So you see for thousands of years that term righteousness 
was associated with a list of things that people are supposed to do. Righteous people were men and women who did or who tried to do everything on the list. The psalmist writes in the Psalm 119, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is the truth. And if we skip over to Proverbs, it says, The righteous hate falsehood. The thoughts of the righteous are just, and the desire of the righteous ends only in good. Grace. Righteousness. Righteous means doing the right things. When we behave in this way, promises Proverbs, everything ends in good. That's different than everything is good. So when we listen to the writer of Proverbs, when we understand that our goal and our focus is to do godly things, to do good things. And when that focus is the utmost of our hearts, all things end only in good. In other words, we're riding to glory on wheels of the law that are snapped onto an axle of obedience. And that grind goes on from law to righteousness, from law to righteousness, from, you get it, from law to righteousness. So when I assess where Paul was, when I assess where the teachings of Paul lead us, I see that Paul uh, had a torment. The problem is that we all experience an inner conflict between the law of God and the law of sin. The laws of God and the laws of our world. So instead of doing good, we do evil. Remember Paul had this conflict in his heart and in his life where he would say, there's no one that is righteous, not, not even one. Well, looking inward, Paul would confess out loud, even in his writings, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do, I do not do what I do and what I want. There must be a better way and Paul finds that better way. A uh, Benedictine nun, Joan Christer, says that faith is beyond a, domina a denominational purity. It is more than religious devotion. It's more than saintly rigor. Faith rests in the arm of God who trusts today and accepts tomorrow because faith knows that whatever the day is, God is part of it. Think of that. Whatever the day is, God is in it. Faith is the willingness to trust God, to rest our lives and ourselves in, in God's arms. We trust God to work through us even when our bodies begin to fail. We trust Jesus to lead us even when we wander through the thickest of difficult times, when we're making moral choices in school or at work, and we trust the Holy Spirit to uplift us, even when our careers disappoint us and our friends let us down. Being righteous in these kinds of situations doesn't come from moral perfection. Instead, it's based on taking a ride in that cart of faith. So what do our lives look like when we're riding in that carriage of faith? Remember Martin Luther? What he said was, good works do not make a good person. But a good person does good works. He knew that only our faith in Jesus Christ could make us good in the eyes of God. But once we are right with God, then our job is to go out and do the right things. So good Christians behave in ways that are compassionate, are kind, are humble, are patient, are loving, and forgiving. They do this 
not because they're naturally just wonderful people, but because Jesus has already forgiven them. Forgive each other, says Paul, just as the Lord has forgiven you. In our world, and in our title, love, not obligation, we as Christians don't serve each other. We don't serve our families. We don't serve the world because we have to. We don't care and love our children because we have to. We're obligated to them because we birthed them or our spouses because we married them or our associates because we befriended them. We love them because God loved us first. Because that is what the love that saves us is all about. Compassion, kindness, humility, patience, love, forgiveness. All of these qualities begin with Jesus. And they become ours when we trust in Jesus. That wheel of faithful living has been turning since the time of Abraham. And it was reinvented by Paul. When he discovered that we're made righteous through our faith. <clears throat> so let us trust God's son, Jesus. Rolling into our future and the future, future of our world. Knowing that we are right with God and right with one another. It is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.